Um, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, this talk is going to be about how to prove knowledge of small secrets. Um, this is joint work with Ivan Damgård and Kasper Larsen and Michael Nielsen from Aarhus University. Um, it's a very, very short, very, very short reminder about uh, what we're, uh, what is your knowledge proofs? Uh, you all know that just, just to recap, so we all know what we're talking about. Uh, we have a relation R and we have a prover P1, a verifier uh, P2. There's a statement V, both the prover and the verifier are aware of. And uh, the prover wants to con uh, convince the verifier of the truth of uh, a statement V using an inter interactive protocol pi. And therefore it has a, uh, a witness W and they exchange messages and the whole protocol has to have the following three properties. First of all, uh, we want that um, whenever the prover actually has a correct witness for the relation, that the verifier will accept. Um, second, if the prover um, starts this protocol with something which is not a correct witness for the relation, then uh, the verifier is not supposed to accept and uh, zero knowledge, um, meaning that um, you can simulate a proper protocol transcript only having the relation and the statement. So being able to uh, generate a, a to sample from the distribution um, that is close to protocol transcripts uh, without having the witness efficiently. Um, why, do you, why would you like to uh, prove that a secret is short? Um, first of all, uh, very often when we um, when we use zero-knowledge proofs in interactive protocols, we use them as a building block, for example, to show that we have knowledge of, um, let's say, uh, the pre-image of a ciphertext. So we know a plain text and we know some randomness, and they encrypt to a certain ciphertext. Then, um, for special encryption schemes, we may have to prove an additional thing, which is not just that we know a plain text and that we know some randomness, but that both of them fulfill certain criteria of shortness. Um, so for example, if you think about lattice-based crypto systems, um, your encryption procedure will always include something like sample from a Gaussian distribution or from some um, sample randomness from some small interval or so. And um, you will actually have to prove in zero knowledge and in an interactive protocol um, that this is fulfilled. Um, why so? If you, uh, if you think about it, when you decrypt in, in lattice-based crypto systems, you mostly get these, uh, let's say, noisy plain text, right? You get um, both your message plus some, plus some randomness on top, which if you do a modular reduction, it goes away. But then the problem is if your, if your noise here gets too large, then depending on the message, this may wrap around or not. And this you can, this is an adversary and an inter inter interactive protocol could use to figure out uh, which um, messages, for example, another party encrypted, um, depending on if a protocol aborts or not. Um, and this we want to avoid. And therefore, it's very crucial to have uh, these zero knowledge proofs, for example, in this situation. Um, more in general, uh, in our work, we define um, homomorphic one-way functions over the integers as the main building block we're talking about. So what is a, what is a uh, homomorphic one-way function over the integers, or short IV uh, one-way function? So assume we have an abelian group G, and uh, we map from uh, the integers or a vector of integers into this abelian group G. Then uh, such, a, such a map is called um, a homomorphic one-way function over the integers if, well, first of all, if it is a one-way function. So we assume that uh, evaluating the function is, can be done in polynomial time. Um, but if I give you um, an element from this abelian group G um, and you want to find a pre-image, then it is very hard to find one, assuming uh, that it's supposed to be short. So this is where the, the shortness comes into play. And third, of, uh, third one, third criter criterion is um, the homomorphic property, meaning that the, the map into the abelian group G is supposed to carry over some of the uh, additive structure into the abelian group. Um, as an example, in addition to um, lattice-based crypto systems, 
um, one could consider GGH hashing as the uh, prime example of what is such a homomorphic one-way function. Um, so you sample, uh, in, in GGH hashing, what you do is you sample a random matrix M, which is very wide on one side and then compressing on the other side. And then you define F to be um, the application of this map to a binary vector. And uh, so what you throw in is, or what you input in this function is a binary vector that is rather long, let's say R, and what you get out is a, a, a lot shorter vector, but which is from uh, the elements from ZQ and not just uh, binary, vector, binary elements. And it is, uh, it is known since 1996 that this uh, finding, finding short pre-images for, uh, for this uh, GGH hash function reduces to known lattice problems which we think are hard. Huh. Um, other examples for, um, for in homomorphic one-way functions would be, for example, the Swift hash function, as I said, ring LWE encryption, or, for example, in integer commitments. So the title of this talk is uh, how to prove uh, that something is short. Um, the first idea coming to one's mind may be, uh, let's use Sigma protocols. Just to, to remind you what Sigma protocols are, um, you sample an auxiliary value S um, that is supposed to be short. That's what the prover does. He applies the one-way function, sends it over to the verifier, and the verifier decides. He flips a bit and says, well, either show me that this value here uh, was good, so send it to me if E is zero, or if E is one, send me the sum of the two values, S and X, where X is the element you want to prove shortness of. So it's typical uh, Sigma protocol. Um, in addition to, to what we have normal Sigma protocols here, since this is smaller than B, and our X is supposed to be smaller than B, <clears throat> the sum of the two must be smaller than 2B. Uh, it will turn out that um, what, what we can verify in the end and how far this is away from the original bound uh, is, is actually very crucial. And uh, we call this the sound slack in, in our work. And um, as, as you know, uh, Sigma protocol, if you do it this way, only gives you uh, soundness one half, basically, because you only have one bit challenge, right? Um, so if you want to uh, have security to, to, uh, against the cheating prover with probability two to the minus k, then you have to repeat this thing uh, k times. So you have to generate k of these auxiliary values, um, which we call the overhead. Um, so first of all, the, the, this sigma protocol gives you a very, very small soundness slack. So can we also make the overhead small? Then we would be definitely done but then I probably wouldn't stand here. Um, turns out it's not that easy. Um, first idea would be like, let, let's, let's take this here from a larger interval, like what could possibly go wrong? Um, correctness would still be, the whole thing would still be correct, but if you, if you want to prove that you can extract a witness using a special soundness pro uh, property, then um, you would normally do this by taking two accepting transcripts with the same auxiliary value um, and subtracting uh, the equations from each other which are supposed to hold. But then uh, it's quite immediate that you have to divide by the difference of the challenges over the integers. But uh, if, if E is zero or one, then the difference is one or minus one, right? You can always divide by that. But um, if you choose E from a larger interval, you may have to divide by two, three, five, which over the integers is not always possible, or in the worst case, by zero. So, but don't worry, not all hope is lost. Um, the most straightforward idea would now be, what can we, if we can't go for one ciphertext and make it better, or one pre-image and make it better, can we prove um, knowledge of a lot of them at the same time while making the overhead quite small? And if you do, if you just do the naive repetition of sigma protocols, um, you get um, k overhead, where k is the statistical security parameter, whereas the soundness lag is very small. In some work by uh, Kramer and Damgaard in 2009, they showed that basically uh, the complete opposite also holds, 
that you can have uh, soundness like that is exponentially far away from what you actually wanted to prove, but on the other hand, that, that the overhead is very, very small. Um, in, 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 the speeds, uh, in the speeds MPC protocol, there was some additional, uh, let's say, trade-off between these two things, um, where they achieved polynomial soundness lag and logarithmic overhead using some techniques um, Due to, uh, due to Nielsen and uh, Olandi. And in, in, in this work, we show that by having a slightly super polynomial um, soundness lag, we can actually go down to constant overhead again. Um, the, the reason why we care about this is um, this overhead means additional messages we have to send in an MPC protocol if we use uh, zero knowledge proofs. And um, the less we send, the better for MPC in the real world. So how do we get down to, um, to constant overhead? So uh, in the first step of a protocol, let's say we have, we have n values of which we want to prove um, knowledge of. So let's say we have xi um, from x1 to xn. And what we do in the first step is we sample t auxiliary values for a t which is supposed to be defined later. So what we do is, a, first of all, a traditional cut and choose, where the prover chooses a lot of auxiliary values, um, sends, applies the function f, sends them over to the verifier, the verifier chooses a subset, and the prover opens that subset to him. So the prover looks at all of, uh, the verifier looks at all of these opened uh, choices that he made, and if they're all like short, and if they actually all exist, um, then in the next step, the prover will send him for the remaining values sums of um, the, the secret that he wants to prove knowledge of and the auxiliary value. So what do we intuitively achieve by doing this? Um, for the, using the cut and choose, what we get is that most of the auxiliary values that were not opened are also short and, are, um, and, and do also exist. Now, if we send sums with um, all the secrets that we have, what is actually true is that most of the values you want to prove knowledge of do exist and are short. So these, so basically, we do cut and choose on, on, on random values, but at the same time achieve a cut and choose effect on what we actually want to prove knowledge of. So we start out by n values you want to prove knowledge of, and doing this, we get down to k um, that are still to be, uh, to be proven, where k is the statistical security parameter. And uh, what we show in our work is that uh, if you set this t to be 3 times n, so linear um, in, in the number of uh, values you want to prove knowledge of, then um, uh, everything is fine. In normal cut and choose, you would set t to be 2n, but we have to do some rejection sampling in order to keep the, the sound slack small. And we, we, we cope for the rejections by having this t to be a little bit larger. And in addition, we show that you do not, uh, in, in, in the work in, in speeds 2, they need to assume uh, random oracles in order to be able to extract. And we get around this using some, um, some, some interesting techniques. So now that we're done with this, um, now that we're done from n to k, unproven images, pre-images, let's get from k to 0. So how do we do that? Um, the idea is to basically do the same as we did before with the cut and choose. But instead of going for each value individually, we let the verifier sample um, sums, random sums of, of these pre-images, and let the, ver let the prover prove knowledge of these. And for this proof, um, we then use the same cut and choose as before again. So why, uh, why do we hope that this works? Or what is the intuition behind that? The intuition is to, um, let's look at this from a balls and bins perspective. Um, let's say the, the verifier says, uh, the approver put these values into the first bin, these values into the second bin, and these values into the third bin. And then, prove me knowledge of the sum of all of these values, right? Then, he's, uh, then the verifier is going to be happy if 
um, let's say this, this red one, these red ones are the ones we didn't, we weren't able to explain yet, then if there's only one of these unexplained or bad pre-images in the bucket, then we're happy, and if there's zero or two or three, then we're not that happy. Um, the reason for the happiness of the verifier can be found in the linearity uh, of, or in the homomorphic property of the uh, one-way function. So assume we already have an x4 and we have an x9 to explain certain values, and um, now we're left to, in, in the soundness proof, we are left with extracting an x3. And the prover was actually able to convince us that the sum of these values is short then um, since we already know that the other two values in the equation are short, we can just like subtract them um, from, uh, from the, um, since, since the proof of that the sum is short um, is, is also sound, we can just get the, um, extract the pre-image there, subtract the x4, x9, and um, there we go. We have a, a pre-image for, um, that, is, that, that goes to the same value as x3, and it's also short. So that's, that's the uh, um, most fundamental insight. Um, so, so now we just have to, uh, for a, um, in, in an actual proof, now we just have to uh, figure out how often does this event happen, so we know how often the verifier has to generate sums. Um, in our work, we are able to, um, so but what we do is we establish a, a certain invariant, which is that if you, um, if you for a certain set of uh, bins and bad elements, and uh, if, if you play this game a few number of times, we show that um, with probability exponential small and the number of um, bad pre-images, um, you would be able, so this, this event will occur often enough. To, to be able to extract um, for a um, to, to be able to extract so um, so this this holds for certain uh, choices of B and T so um, but unfortunately this goes the, the the probability goes actually down in the number of bad preimages right so if we if we have let's say in, in in one round if we have extracted half of them then in the next round with uh, only probability two to the minus k over two, um, we can extract the rest. So we actually have to um, play this game now two times, right? Um, we moreover uh, then show that actually um, if, we, if we start with uh, k sums the first time in the first round and we extract, let's say, half of the pre-images, then the second time um, we actually only need uh, to have k half um, of these of these sums or buckets in every in every such instance, um, we now have two instant two instances to do, but you know the number of buckets goes by in half. You play the game twice, so like, it cancels out, and actually the number of sums you play per round is constant. Um, and in addition, um, as you as you as you now see, if we if we go in half in the first round and we go. Uh, in half in the second round, again, we have to play this game a logarithmic number of times. So this um, is already like the overall protocol. In the, first, uh, in the first step, as I said, you do the cut and choose and open the sum of the uh, auxiliary value and the secret you want to prove knowledge of. And in the second step, you do uh, a, a cut and choose again, but this time, instead of the actual elements, you would use these random sums as chosen, um, as explained before. So what about the overhead? Um, if, if, if you have, let's say, a constant number of sums, which is, let's say, linear in k uh, in, every, in every round that you play, and you play a logarithmic number of rounds, all in all, you will have k times log k sums you have to prove knowledge of. So we have to choose n to be bigger than k times log k to get overhead that is constant. Um, additionally, um, the cut and choose is actually imperfect. Right From the first step, we had that k, uh, from the n values, k are still remaining unexplained, right? This will also happen to us again if we, um, if we, if we do the cut and choose in the second step, but uh, we show that, you know, this doesn't, the chance that this actually, like, matters is very, very small, so we kind of get away. 
Um, a caveat is if we, um, if we actually try to prove that a sound is bound, uh, a bound and a sound is lag, then in, in our work at least we were only able to achieve something that is um, slightly super polynomial in the security parameter. But I mean, you can, you can always, let's say, go for, let's say if you, if you want to prove security parameter 40, you can just uh, apply or proof twice for security parameter 20 and uh, you know, fine. Question is, of course, uh, are we done yet? Um, first of all, our analysis uh, comes with large hidden constants. I mean, it's, it's uh, super polynomial and you know, the number of auxiliary values is, is constant, but it's a big constant. Um, so one would, uh, f if you want to apply this in practice, definitely like to, um, to get these hidden constants smaller. Um, moreover, we have this uh, quasi-polynomial soundness lag and getting this down to something that's polynomial or linear would definitely be desirable. And also it would be nice to see whether this actually works and how it performs in practice. And after we published our uh, work on ePrint, there was some um, subsequent work by uh, Kramer and Damgott who showed that um, actually you can do uh, this whole thing with a linear soundness lag but they need um, this n to be bigger than k squared, where in our case it was k times log k. So first of all, um, their techniques for, um, for, for, for getting there are like a little more involved than our somewhat uh, simplistic pins and balls game. Um, so it's definitely also interesting to see, to look at our, their work and how it evolves. Um, so if you, if, you, if you compare everything on a graph, so this is how the current state of the art looks like. You have Zygmunt protocols at uh, one end of the whole game. You have Kramer Damgard on the other end. Um, the speed's two proof here, and we were able to get somewhere close to here. And of course, uh, long-term goal is to get both uh, the soundness slack and the overhead to be as small as possible. And with those words, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions.